you're a straight, straight white male, nobody likes you anymore. It seems to me the teachers have a problem with you questioning now, and a lot of us that are straight white males question why we have people identifying as a cat, and they just don't like that. Like, say it's first day of class, they, yeah. they come in, you go around, or, I mean, some people want to share, some people don't want to share what their pronouns are. And then say you go up to somebody and you call them the wrong pronoun, then a lot of people get, their feelings will be hurt because you identified them as something they don't want to be identified as. Didn't you, didn't you write that you identified as, uh, I think you identified as a horse or something? Oh, I put down on one and it's an attack helicopter. That's it, yeah. Teacher yes, didn't like that one. Yes. But, you know, you can identify as a cat or a dog, just not, a, just not an helicopter. <laughs> that's just, that's crossing too many lines. A small fringe minority holding unacceptable uh, views. Hello, this is Wayne Baker, first selected candidate for the People's Party of Canada with episode number three of the Purple Microphone. Over the last five years, you've surely observed the woke ideology has been increasingly pushed upon children and teens by the government, media, and the school system. The woke movement began innocently enough, bringing to light subtle and fringe forms of discrimination based on gender, sexual orientation, and race. Today, however, it has become the source of a new form of systemic discrimination against people who do not fall into any of its alphabet soup identities. Nowhere is such discrimination more apparent than in the government-funded education systems. For an insider's account of what's really happening, John Manley and I interviewed Daniel Hudson, a student at Stratford District Secondary School. Daniel lives in Perth County. When Daniel turned 14, he took his first job working on a dairy farm. He is now 17 and is apprenticing at Van Ness Repair, where he is learning to become a car mechanic. In this week's episode, we discuss how Daniel has been discriminated against for being white, straight, male, and his worst offense, a critical thinker. Why Daniel was kicked out of class 10 times in 2023 for asking his teacher questions the guilt being hoisted upon innocent students for crimes committed before they were even born by the Indigenous residential school system, how students can identify as animals, even wearing dog tags and barking, yet Daniel gets in trouble for pretending to be a pineapple, how teachers are favoring students who identify as transgender or homosexual, how transgender legislation is undermining parents and destroying families, disturbing evidence linking queer theory and pedophilia, the 1,400 students in Daniel Hudson's school are being forced to conform to the ideology of 40 gay and gender dysphoric students. This interview contains some shocking and mature content. Viewer listener discretion is advised. So, do you want to give us a, a bit of a rundown of who you are and what you're doing, and uh, and some of the, maybe a couple of stories you've 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 had? So sure, um, I'm Daniel Hudson. I go to uh, Stratford District Secondary School in Grade Eleven. Um, currently working at uh, Van Ness Repair for uh, co-op. Um, had a lot of interesting stories about um, very liberal to say. Um, I don't know what you want to call it, um, excuses for yeah, ignorance, I would say. Um, 
a lot of the new curriculum in the school is, in my opinion, very corrupt. Um, a lot of stories of, like, say, correcting the teacher getting kicked out of class and just getting, I don't know, getting in trouble for reasons you really should not be anymore. Can you give us one example of how you, um, were you kicked out of class? Oh, I've been kicked out many times. How many times as many? Uh, I don't know, 10 or so, easily. Ten. And what, Just last, this year. Just this year? Yeah. <laughs> were you kicked out previous year? Like, when did you start getting kicked out? Which grade uh, did it start happening? Mostly this year, mostly, I don't know, probably shouldn't name names on here, but mostly because of one teacher. Okay. Um, my English teacher really, in my opinion, is a hardcore liberal. Um, and they changed the whole curriculum now for grade 11 English is all Indigenous Studies based. And a lot of the facts that our teacher is um, telling us, in my opinion, are not true. And she doesn't have any, a lot of support to back that up. What kind of facts? Um, one story I can tell you now. So she was telling us about um, how they found all those uh, what was it? Uh, burial or unmarked burial grounds uh, by the residential schools. So I put my hand up and told her that that was false information, and I got sent down to the office for that one. And but I told her I could prove that it was fake, and she just sent me straight down to the office. So she didn't give you an opportunity no. to no. present any evidence. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that's a head shaker. Yeah, that's a head shaker. Um, yeah, that uh, that doesn't make sense. Like, no. I, I, I could understand if he was in class and he said, you know, something like, "I hate all indigenous people and we should kill the rest of them off." Well, maybe he should have a talk with the yeah. principal. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I personally, I have no problem with them at all. Like, they if they do their thing, I'll do my thing. That's how it is. I'm not gonna. I got nothing. No problem with them at all. Now, what proof did you have then? I oh, cracked did open the laptop. Yep, yeah, and I searched. I found, looked up. Um, I don't remember exactly. What I looked, looked up, but I was sat on the laptop for about thirty seconds, and I found five sources saying it was fake. Yeah, because they never actually unearthed these graves. It no. was just done with. Yeah, they did the X-rays. Or, yeah, yeah, and I, the sound or sound. Oh, furniture. sound. Yeah, yeah sound, sound penetration. penetration. Yeah. yeah. Because one of the schools, they actually went down to the basement, or it was under a church where they claimed there was one of these burial, and they actually dug it up, and they found it was just boulders. Yeah. Yeah. I, I have no doubt that there are unmarked graves. Oh, I understand. The, the reason being is the graves were originally marked, yeah. but they would have been marked with, with wooden crosses yeah. or, or, or wooden markers. And over the years, those, you know, what does, what, what does, it deteriorates and it would have broken back down into the dirt, yeah, into exactly. the ground. Um, they really didn't have resources for anything else other no. than those wood markers. So, so um, claiming them to be unmarked graves is, yeah, okay, that's fine, they are unmarked. Yeah. Um, I have a, a, you know, on that tangent, um, we, we have, like our, our residential schools were based off of Great Britain yep. and the British um, um, insisted their children go into residential schools and they were treated pretty well as harsh as, if you want to call it harsh. Yep. Um, I, think, I think these schools were a magnet for less than idealistic teachers and less than ideal teachers, you just described one yourself. Yeah, exactly. Um, that are, uh, are that they were corrupt. They had other motivations other mm -hmm. than to teach, and that left some very seriously scarred people. Oh, yeah. So, and that's unfortunate. And they were so underfunded that they only attracted the lowest, you know, of the workers who were willing to go out to a remote location and get paid almost nothing. Yeah. Yeah. So, I mean, the whole, a lot of it was economical problems. Yeah. I mean, well, there was a lot of problems with it, but I think, though at the same time, by making it worse, by pointing to places where there wasn't any graves and saying there's even more unmarked graves, yeah. when I think the official numbers already, already admitted like 75,000 children died in the system, so and the, why are you getting sent to the office over this, you yeah. know? And, and, and the deaths? were not necessarily as a result of cruelty. No. Uh, 
we, we, we have to remember that these, these children died before penicillin. Yeah. So if they, if they and, and they were in relatively harsh conditions, mm -hmm. so if they contracted any kind of um, cold, um, they could very easily succumb to that. And, totally then, and there was no medication to, to, no. Them, to, to stop it or slow it down. So, yeah. so it, it's just a, a reality of, of what our life was like um, and, and, and how harsh it was. There is some interesting ideas, though, that they did experiment a lot of vaccines on the indigenous children. They were the first ones to be tested for new vaccines. Okay. That would never go wrong, of course. But <laughs> and the other observation I heard too was one: I, the um, there was hardly any ventilation in these schools because they were trying to save on heat. Oh, okay. So they kept everything shut up, and then they would put chlorine on everything. So I've heard stories, they go into these buildings and it just stunk like chlorine and there's no open windows. And then you wonder why people are getting lung infections. Bring tears to your eyes, yeah. Yeah, so, but um, have you been, what else have you been kicked out for? This is um, good. <laughs> a lot of, uh, say, there's a couple kids in my class that I'm fairly sure identify as like specialty pronouns or whatever you want to call them. By specialty, do you mean beyond his and her? Yeah, something like that. His, her, and they, and then there's yeah, more. Yeah, exactly. Um, okay. Pointing that out, like more so, like not pointing it out, but like questioning it. Mm -hmm. Like if say, I don't know, I don't know why I can't. Why can he identify as a cat, but I can't identify as a pineapple? Kind of deal. If you know what I mean. <laughs> you have people identifying as cats. Ah, uh, you'd be surprised. <laughs> There's a couple kids that walk around with like, like the like dog or tie like dog tail like fake dog tail too and stuff, <laughs> and like meow meow and barking and that kind of thing. Do they ever speak English? Uh, I I assume they do. Okay, I was just saying that's an easy way to get out of having to answer questions oh, in the class. Too, you... yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so you were kicked out for questioning. What yeah, this question. Was... Questioning, questioning why this is in the school system. They just kick you out. Basically. Yeah, like no no rhyme or reason, just you're gone. <laughs> well, uh, let me pull up this one clip I got. It's with, uh, you know Josh Alexander? Uh, I don't think so. I mean, you know Josh Alexander. I know, yeah. yeah. yeah he, he's a young young man that was in the Catholic, well he was in the public system, went into the Catholic system. Oh yeah. And he was uh, kicked out of uh, school oh. for standing up um, for his, uh, like, the young women in the school. Yeah. Um, they have their own washroom and he yeah, set yeah. up well, and said... they don't, that's the problem. That's, that's, that's <laughs> the issue, yeah. Yeah, okay. Yeah. So he stood up and he ended up getting kicked out as well. I got to play a little clip here with Jordan Peterson where he tells one of the first times he got kicked out of class. I think you'll, you'll appreciate it. And what's the rationale for... I'll get back to your parents, but what's the rationale for your continued suspension exactly? I mean, that's a big, that's a long suspension. Yes. I don't know what you'd have to do on the juvenile delinquent side to warrant that sort of suspension, but it would have to be something pretty damn serious. Maybe you'd have to knock a teacher unconscious with a metal chair, for example, like happened last week in the U.S., though I doubt if they'd suspend that student for 10 months. I guess we'll see. So what's the rationale for, the, for, for keeping you out of school? And this is so a Catholic far, school, right? Yeah, it's a Catholic school. Which makes school. it even more blackly comical as far as I'm concerned. Yeah. Because you'd think they might be on the side of the, you know, the, the scriptures. Yeah. Just, you might. That, that, that was what I guess. thought. Like, I'm, I'm personally not a Catholic. I'm a born-again Christian. But um, going into the Catholic board, I would have assumed that they would um, maybe sympathize with my views a little more than they did. But anyways, we get in there, and actually it was on one of my first days in the school, um, this wasn't why I was kicked out, but this was kind of where I realized that, wow, this is not a uh, very biblically-based school. When my math teacher started saying that uh, creation was uh, a myth and it was all hypothetical in the Bible, and he started saying the entire Bible is hypothetical. Mm -hmm. And uh, so I challenged him on that a bit, but... Uh, As opposed to the unalienable truths of woke doctrine. Exactly. <laughs> so he... Uh, 
anyways, that that teacher um, ended up being the one, the the uh, teacher whose classroom um, the debate broke out where I actually got kicked out for an extended period of time, and uh, it was because um, he was shouting at me like. Uh, I was in a classroom of 30 students, I'm in the back right corner, and I have all these students turned around their desks and the teacher just shouting at me. Mm -hmm. um, and, and what uh, did you do to provoke him? Um, so two students beside me started asking about an interaction that had happened earlier in the day um, because I had been uh, called to the office and whatnot um, because I, uh, I challenged my uh, law teacher where she was talking about how... Um, students can be whatever gender they want and all that. Mm -hmm. And I challenged my law teacher on that. And that was something that uh, me and that teacher, we would respectfully go back and forth, mm -hmm. like mm -hmm. nonstop. Um, from, from the very first uh, day I was there, the first five minutes I was in her class, um, she went on to say that the Freedom Convoy was unlawful um, mm -hmm. before it had even gone through the courts. So we, we started, that was the first one, and it just went on every single day. We'd go back and forth, and it was always polite, and it was always fun, but we never agreed on anything. And uh, anyways, um, some students heard that there was a quite a controversial debate in her class the other day or the other morning, and they wanted to uh, hear what happened. So these students are asking me questions. I'm answering them, giving my opinions on it. Um, and uh, the teacher gets involved in it. And long story short, he says that um, there's like 73 genders or something, and uh, it's a spectrum, and we can be whatever we want to be, and I should explore myself, and males can breastfeed children, and all sorts of just crazy stuff. And at the at that statement that males can breastfeed children, I I responded to that and said uh, that's pedophilia. Mm -hmm. And this is where it got really awkward, and the debate kind of started to turn. Um, he said, "What do you mean that's pedophilia?" And I had to explain to my entire math class that my math teacher was um, defending and promoting grown men forcing a baby to suck on their nipples. <laughs> and I'm, I'm in the math class. So this is, it, it's completely ridiculous and it's a pretty awkward topic to be having with all these students watching. <laughs> and anyways, um, he starts to get like really agitated because now I've used a fairly strong term. Um, and uh, he's, uh, he uh, tells me that uh, I'm just really not tolerant and mm -hmm. uh, I need to be more thoughtful You're in not, my surroundings. As it turns I'm not, out. I, and I, I, I don't think tolerance is a virtue. It's the virtue of those without morals, right? Mm -hmm. And uh, so I, I don't believe in tolerance, um, at least not to the uh, the level that it's at today. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, anyways, I... Uh, I ended up quoting Mark 10.6 um, in response to a student who I've now learned after the fact identified differently, um, stood up out of their chair, pointing their finger at me, like walking towards me, shouting in math class, um, saying that uh, I need to be more uh, open-minded and, and mm -hmm. people can be whatever they want to be. Mark 10.6, what's the Mark verse? Mark 10.6, I said, God created the male and female. And it's that simple. And uh, I said, look, I don't have a problem with you identifying differently or anybody, but... Uh, that's up to them. The board should not be pushing that. Teachers should not be promoting this stuff in their classes and lying to That's their students. Sure. It's harming children. And uh, I said, you have your right to do whatever you want to do in private, but don't bring it up with students here. And it, it certainly doesn't change biology and reality. Um, and anyways, that was it. That was the, uh, that was the, uh, right, the verse so that got me in got trouble. You, out, eh? and you don't look surprised. No, not at all. Not even in the slightest. <laughs> I love what he says. Tolerance is virtue without morals. I can agree with that. Because yeah. that bears a question. Like, you were speaking, questioning this. Why were you questioning it? Why didn't you just ignore it? Well, I was questioning it because she was so, sort of promoting it, if you know what I mean. Mm -hmm. Like, promoting that people can identify as what they want. I said, well, just because I don't look like a pineapple, why can't I be a pineapple? But you, you don't look like a cat, but you can be a cat. Like... I don't understand why that makes sense to me. Or that doesn't make sense to me, sorry. Good for you. Yeah. Good for you. It's, it's, it's incidents like that that, that we, need to, we need to encourage. Um, school, the primary objective of school is to not, not to teach, but to encourage you to question. Yeah. And without that questioning nature and without that encouragement, school really isn't doing its job. No, our, not our at all. Our education really isn't doing its job. No. Um, so 
yeah, good, good for you, good for you, good for you for standing up and yeah, you know, you should have put on a pineapple hat or something, <laughs> 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 or better yet, a pina colada, right? Yeah. <laughs> What else have you been kicked out for? Is it the same scene or? More so around that kind of between the indigenous related stuff and then people wanting to identify as what they want to kind of deal. I'm not, I wouldn't say, like I don't just try to derail the class or whatever, but if the teacher says something that doesn't make any sense or is just completely false, I'm going to point her out on it. Mm -hmm. Not to make her look stupid and all, just because like, I just don't agree with it. You're, you're questioning. Yeah, right? questioning what... Because maybe she can present you with something that will make yeah. you think, Oh, well, I've been wrong all the time. Yeah, show me some evidence. All right, yeah, all right, I'll, I'll back you then. Instead, I got you, to... you sent to the... What happens when you get sent to the principal's office? Basically, I don't know, they sit there, you talk to the principal, and depending on how bad it was, they'll send you home and get suspended, or they just call your parents, and you... What does have... the principal tell you? Depends. Depends on how severe it is. Well, how, what, what's the severity? How many you determine severity? A lot of times, like, when she kicks you out, like, you just, you can't come back to class. Like, you don't go all the way down to the office, you just, like, get kicked out of class, if you know what I mean. So, the, it's not severity of what you did, it's the severity of how upset she is? Basically. So, like, if, if she were to get real, real pissed off, then, yeah, you'd have to, she'd haul you down to the office. Then you'd have to talk to the principal. Like, because, I mean, just hearing this thing with Josh, I mean, this is a math class. Yeah. When I was in math class, this is much inter more interesting than the math class I was oh, yeah. in. Cause <laughs> I was getting lost by grade 11 with the calculus and the algebra, and, yep. you know, this. But we never discussed anything no. like this in no, math school's, class. No, in my opinion, school's too political now. I, I have, I, I, I'd like to share an incident. Um, now, if you listen to CBC at all, there is a reporter that praises Mrs. Lukianchuk. She's a, she was his high school English teacher, mm -hmm. and he praised her to to, um, to heaven and beyond, if you will. She, he, he really thought she was the most awesome teacher um, he ever had. Mrs. Lukianchuk was my teacher as well, and she was a phenomenally good English teacher. She was. Uh, um, British lady, um, and she was um, had complete command of the class. She knew what she was teaching. She knew what she was talking about, and she encouraged me through high school because I was I was struggling with English. I'm the opposite to you, John. Um, math like that, mm -hmm. but English, uh, no, that was a struggle. So, anyways, we uh, we read the Mayor of Casterbridge. And uh, I love to read, so I, I read the entire book. And we're talking, reviewing it. Um, and she, I, part, part way through the review, I sort of stuck my hand up. I'm one of those kids, back of the class, you know, yep. not, not, really, uh, not really into it, but oh, what the heck. So I stuck my hand up. And, <laughs> You're stuck there, you might as well. <laughs> yeah, that's right. I put my hand up and I said, and, and she responded to my hand. And, and I said, you know, I'm really thinking that the mayor of Casterbridge is all about the, uh, the theory of evolution. And she stopped. And she says, what do you mean? I said, it's all about the theory of evolution. And I explained how the, the, the uh, um, main character um, went through his life, you know, lived his life, and he didn't, didn't actually have any children to carry on to the next generation. And, but the... Uh, the um, more um, likable character did have children to carry on to the next generation, and so uh, hmm. she uh, she stopped, and it completely threw her entire lesson plan for the day. And rather than kicking me out, she mm -hmm. just encouraged she encouraged it. And uh, I heard from like there were two classes uh, that she taught at the same level. And I heard from the other class that Wayne Baker come up with this. And I don't know where he got it from, but he's spot on. And, and so I disrupted two of her, her, two of her classes um, from that one comment. So, so that's the mark of a good teacher. Yeah. Um, to have a teacher um, not allow you to question and to uh, uh, 
basically so, discipline for questioning. Yeah, 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 yeah. I mean, good on you. Yeah. Good on you, Dave. Yes. Um, something we didn't get into in the beginning, and I, I think it wouldn't hurt to touch base. You're, you're obviously a, a, a kid that's got lots of courage. Oh, yeah. Um, Basically, don't care what people think of me. I just do what I want. How, how, how did you come to that way? Is it, is it just... Like, I don't know, just... You have a good family? Like, you oh, yeah. Have it? yeah. You, you, Hard-working family. Good. Yeah. If, you, if your dad got called to, uh, or your, your parents got called to the principal, would they, uh, they high-five you on the way out? Depends what it is. But, yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah. If I, lost, if I lost, then probably not. But if, you, if I lost the fight, then probably not. <laughs> 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 Sounds a lot like my parents. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Like, like I say, good, good on you. Good yeah. for, good for having the courage to stand up. Yes. Yeah. We stand up for what I know is right. That's right. Yeah, That's and right. I think too. You just said you just do what you want. Do you Pretty want much. to put a caveat on that? Well, well sort of. Because <laughs> some are going to interpret that as you just don't care about. Well, it, yeah. It, you know. Yeah, yeah. It sounds like you like to do the right thing. So yeah, that. more so the right thing, not you know. Not disrupt the class, is what I mean. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Disrupt it for the good for a good reason, not just to be a dick. <laughs> <laughs> I am curious about this indigenous program. Like you're saying that there's is it all it's just grade eleven was it? Yeah, just grade so all of grade eleven English classes, whether it's college level or university level. Um, it's like so we read passages that are passages and books that are read by indigenous people. And then we have to... You're reading passages that are read by indigenous people? Or sorry, written, 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 oh, written, okay. written yeah. by indigenous people. Um, so we have to read these passages and books that are written by indigenous people and do book reports and stuff about them, which, I mean, sure, that's fine and all, but then, I don't know, it just gets too carried away with it. Like, we were talk I had an entire week about the residential schools and stuff. I, like, this, this is an English class, not history class, in my opinion. Yeah. And are these writings modern indigenous people? Cause uh, most of, as far as I know, yeah. Because most the Ojibwe had some written language, but most, yeah, most, of most cultures written in English, yeah. Didn't have a language to write in. So. Yeah. Is it is it primarily Canadian indigenous? Yeah, 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 yeah all, okay. all Canadian. All Canadian. Yeah. Okay. Well, to some degree, I think that you know that's not totally. I mean, there's some positive in the idea of introducing some indigenous literature into the program, yeah. which I don't remember any when I was in school. No. So. No. No. But if they're taking over a whole year for it, that's... Yeah, exactly. Yeah, we, we should... I, I really think that there should be exposure to indigenous literature, but there yeah. should also be exposure to to uh, um, Greek literature. There should be exposure to... Uh, <laughs> there's none of that in our schools. No. Um, uh, well, I, I, I like the, the English literature. Russian, yeah. Russian literature is phenomenal. There's some amazing stuff in Russian literature. Um, other form other foreign writers. Um, yeah. Yeah, you should you should you should be encouraged to experiment with Yeah, exactly. Wh who you read and what you read. So. Yeah, we're basically limited to the indig indigenous related stuff for all of grade 11 in English. Do you know who Colleen Johnson is? I've heard the name. Okay. Yeah, she's uh, uh, she's actually a poet out of uh, Brantford. Oh yeah. yeah. An indigenous poet? Yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah. And, and if you don't mind me pointing out, for the record, you have a fair bit of indigenous genes yourself, don't you? I'm actually Métis. Yeah, you're right. Métis. Yeah. Yeah. My ancestors hid the fact that I was in, I, I'm Métis. Yeah. Um, and, and I guess that ties in with our uh, um, the prevailing thinking at the time that you were somehow less than human if you were indigenous. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And so that, that would explain the motivation for my ancestor to keep it from me. Yeah. Yeah. Um, it's unfortunate, um, but it's, I find it interesting that small-minded people will respond that way. Mm -hmm. And we, we, we experienced that over the last two years, three years now, um, that uh, um, if we chose not to follow the norm or we, you know, for whatever reason we didn't follow the dictates of government, we became somehow less than human. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And that's, um, that's the same with the indigenous population. Yeah. Um, there, there, are, um, there are sad stories on both sides 
of the spectrum. Mm -hmm. And that's something that is, you know, w with the indigenous population, something that's not usually pointed out, is that there were children that did not go to residential school, and those children lived a very hard, hard life out of yes. because they didn't have an education. Yeah. And in our society, one of the one of the hardest or, or most invisible um, handicap is not being able to read. Oh yeah. Uh, not being able to read and write. Uh, yeah. Because people can people look perfectly normal. And so they, they can they can get away with that, that handicap and not really no one can really know for sure that, that they are handicapped that way. Mm -hmm. And it's worse than being blind or, or being deaf. Well actually for blind people it's interesting. You know the brand for school for the blind. Yeah. It's right there. Mm -hmm. They have a ninety percent illiteracy rate. That's the average blind person, only 10% of blind people can read. And interestingly, 90% of blind people who can read get a job. Yeah, I can believe it. 90% who can't read end up on uh, disability. Social assistance, yeah. And it's, and the brand, I, that, when I heard that, that's why we didn't send Joe to the brand for school, we homeschooled him. He can read and write and do it all himself. It's just a matter of practicing each day. I have no idea what they're doing at that school. Mm -hmm. It's unacceptable. If any other school had a 90% illiteracy rate, yep. they're getting there, probably. Oh, I, I bet so. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's, it's absolutely critical. There, there, there are fewer skills, like there, there, I can't think of any other skill that's as critical as being able to read and write oh, yeah. in, in our society. It was funny when I had talked to Daniel before, he, I had asked him if there was any critical race theory going on in this school. And he kind of, I think, misunderstood me at first because you said something along the lines, well, you knew like two black students who yeah. sometimes had a little problem. Had a rough time every now and then, yeah. But nothing really major. No. And then I said, well, what about, is there any discrimination against white people? Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> So you feel the white people are being discriminated more against than the black people? Yep. The, well, it depends on the situation. Sure. I, I, yeah. I'm saying more at a quantity. Yeah, level. exactly. So basically, if you're a straight, straight white male, nobody likes you anymore. Nobody. Well, no. depends, but. So I assume you're a straight white male. Oh, yeah. So how have you been discriminated against in the school system? Basically, what I said about questioning things, like it seems to me, the teachers have a problem with you questioning now, and a lot of us that are straight white males question why we have people identifying as a cat, and they just don't like that. If we look at the teaching profession, and um, I'm not, well, let's let's. Uh, I, I I believe that there are two professions that can be either hyperproductive or hyperparasitical. Yeah. Um, and when I mean hyperproductive, they can they can produce beyond their 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 earnings in terms of moving our, our society forward yeah. and, 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 and building our society a better society for, for the future the generations moving forward. Um, hyperparasitical is a, an occupation that not only drains our society of, of wealth in terms of, of, of uh, remuneration for their for what they do yeah but they're actually detracting while, while they're working they're actually doing harm to our society and those two professions in my opinion are police and teachers yeah teachers they're hyper productive if if no, I, I, I can I can explain it easier in the lower grades, mm -hmm. where a, a, a grade one student should be able to read by the end of grade one. Yeah, yeah. And if if a student isn't able to read, or the, the majority of the class aren't able to read, and they're pa they're they're forwarded on to grade two, they don't have the requisite skills to to, to uh, um, challenge the next grade. Yeah, then they're gonna fall behind. That's right, yeah. and that 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 is hyper parasitic yeah. in my opinion if a teacher is, is going and, and and they're trained and they're, they're they're being paid to do a job they need to ensure that that job's done yeah 
and, right. and, and that, that includes um, teaching, teaching the kids or the children the skills they need to move forward. I got this article from the London Free Press because we kind of want to get the other side's view on here and hear what both of you would respond to this. I'm particularly curious because it's, it's, it's arguing that this is a, about what's happening in the London school system. Some teachers in the London region's largest school board are not using the expected pronouns when addressing transgender students. Would you say this is happening in your school? Yep. So the well, not so the teachers, but the students, yes. The students aren't, but the teachers are. Uh, they try. They try as hard. <laughs> Why do you, are they trying, like, because it's difficult to well, manage it? It's or? difficult to get the right one without hurting somebody's feelings, if you know what I mean? No, I don't. So, like, what do you mean, if you get the right one? Say it was somebody, you've never met them before. Like, say it's first day of class, that yeah. they come in, you go around, and some people want to share, some people don't want to share what their pronouns are. And then say you go up to somebody and you call them the wrong pronoun, then a lot of people get, their feelings will be hurt because you identified them as something they don't want to be identified as. So you're saying in most of these cases, it, it wasn't an, even an intentional mis- More of an accidental thing. Because it, it's very difficult to kind of keep track of yeah. 73 different... Yeah, exactly. How do you react when they ask you to state your personal pronoun um, preference? If it's like a form or something, I just write normal. You write normal. Yeah, normal. <laughs> okay. Did, didn't you? Didn't you write that you identified as? Uh, I think you identified as a horse or something. Oh, I put down on one and it's an attack helicopter. That's it. Yeah. Teacher yes, didn't yes. like that one. Yes. But you know, you can identify as a cat or a dog. Just not. A, just not an helicopter. <laughs> that's just. That's crossing too many lines. So this year, the education director said. Um, a reality one ex- one expert warns will alienate these children. Do you feel these kids feel alienated from the? Um, the or are they being told to feel alienated? I would say more so told. Yeah. The question about alienation is: Is Danny here being white heterosexual male? Yeah. Do you feel um, alienated? Yes. I feel like one of the odd ones out. The issue was thrust under the spotlight this week by Indigenous student trustee Lindsay Neenham. I hope I pronounced that correctly. I really hope I pronounced that correctly. <laughs> <laughs> uh, who told colleagues of the Thames Valley District School Board meeting that she believes some transgender students aren't being called the pronoun they provided they provided to their teachers. First, I find it interesting that they felt it necessary to point out that she was Indigenous. Yes. Yeah. I don't see what that had any significance to the article. It has none at all, but... There, there, there is no significance. The ind- indigenous aspect has no relevance. No, not at all. Mark Fisher, the board's education director, indicated that that, that was the case. Quote, we recognize that mispronouns are still happening, he said. Yeah, we do recognize we have 12,000 employees, and for many of our employees, this is a new learning. At the same time, they refuse to grow and develop and refuse to come along with much of this work. Then there will be an appropriate consequence or sanction to grow and develop. Do you feel that this is something teachers need to grow and develop? I don't think so, in my opinion. Do you feel it's a form of growth, developing this? Gender ideology? It's a I, form of regression. That's what I was going to say, yeah. Regressing to what? Regressing to a form of mob rule. Yeah. Um, a form of, of uh, um, identity in order to be uh, part of the mob, you need to identify and, and identify appropriately. Um, and then it's up to the mob to determine what's appropriate. Mm-hmm. At which point, you're 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 no longer an individual. You're a slave to the mob. Sounds like Marxism. I was leading up to that. <laughs> Sorry to jump ahead. No, that's that's fine. Uh, you're you're exactly right. Jacqueline Specht is the director of the Canadian Research Center on Inclusive Education. <laughs> that's an interesting. Uh, research center at Western University. She says the use of expected pronouns is important for young people who are often ostracized and hear lots of negative comments about being transgender. 
So that's what I was wondering about. Are you finding that ch transgender children in your school are ostracized? And Not anymore, no. More promoted by teachers and staff. Now, I often question the motivation of if someone wants to change their I gender identification. Are they changing it because of their own desires? Or are they changing it because it's the politically astute thing to do? Yeah. Are, you, are you finding a lot of kids that are, are um, identifying as different, what, you know, different uh, genders or different uh, beings? Or, or are, are they doing that? Maybe to get out of work, I out of school work, or probably, or to being favored by teachers, or attention. Okay. Attention. Mm -hmm. It seems like not trying to be a, a bully here, but the odd ones out kind of seem to be the ones that are doing it more so than the rest of the populate, like the bigger group of the population. Mm -hmm. it seems like a horrible price to pay for a bit of attention. Yeah. It seems like there'd be more rewarding and easier ways to get attention. I would assume so. It's interesting because when I was in high school, I, had a, I was in a school of almost a thousand in the mm -hmm. GTA, and I cannot remember one transgender student. Yeah. There was one kid who was uh, born, his mother was the cousin of his father, and he was a little strange and we never were quite too sure which side of the <laughs> spectrum he was on. But even then, he was never bullied. I don't remember him even being, he was just kind of, that was, I forget his name now, but that's just, he's just a strange one, and that was kind of, he was like, he came from the Portuguese islands where they had like a village with ten people, and that was just, <laughs> it turned out. <laughs> um, and we were always kind of jealous, because he got to hang around all the girls. The girls, yeah. just, they didn't, weren't afraid of him, and he was just always with the girls. I mean, we didn't want to be with the girls that much, but he got a lot more attention. <laughs> Um, so I, I, I just find it, how many transgender students do you think, well, how many students are in your school, first of all? Um, I think about 1,400. Oh, wow. And how many transgender students would you I estimate? 40? 40. 40, okay. Well, gay and, and transgender are probably around there. Or like in the that. LGBTQ2S+, plus, I think. That's a good start. Okay. We, we just, we just, this is politically totally incorrect, and for a politician to say this is probably deadly, but uh, <laughs> we just call them alphabet soup. That's fair. I can see that. Yeah. yeah. Well, it's, it's, it, how can you have a community that's that diverse? Yeah. It doesn't even make sense. Or, yeah, exactly. Exactly. How, how, how can they identify as a community when they're, I mean, what we call it, 71 different pronouns? Something like that, yeah. yeah. It's, it's like, when there, you know, 71 different pro pronouns and there's only 70, well, you said 40, 40, 50. Something like that, yeah. That are, uh, that are special. Yeah, 1,400 kids have to confine to a tiny, like, what, that's 5% or something of the population? 8% mm, yeah. or something like that? Yeah, it's, it's very, very small. Yeah. yeah. Uh, the entire population has to confine to has to conform, 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 to, yeah. uh, conform to that, uh, yeah. to that ideology. Yeah. yeah. Because to even answer a question, like we were at a musical on the weekend uh, rehearsal, and they were asking for our personal prom. I just skipped the question, but to be asked that question assumes that I actually think it's a possibility for me to have a personal pronoun. Yeah. And and to think that you, it, it also assumes that you agree with mm -hmm. that whole mentality. Mm -hmm. yes. Which I think is quite harmful to the, especially young children. Oh yeah, exactly. I know it's the only two, the, all the kids identify with the normal gender except for two little girls and I think they're just, you know, they're going through a transition in their life and this is not a way to help them through it by, no. if anything, I consider it psychological child abuse. It is, it, it's, it, um, I tend to go back to the 30s and, and, and the eugenics, eugenics that was uh, was applied to uh, mm -hmm. to non-conforming children, like like when, like they, they we thought that that would um, solve um, 
from some ge genetic shortfalls. Oh, you mean like Down syndrome children and children with mental retardation? There, there, there was that. There was also other things that the, the criminal was, misbehavior and that. And, or um, deformities. Oh, like physical yeah. deformities. Yeah. yeah. Oh, okay. Like, like, like you have the yeah. problem genetic. with your eyes, and and, yeah. and, and so like, like they, they were, they were. Um, experimenting with that, they were experimenting with the black population with, oh, yeah. uh, with um, um, syphilis. I don't know. That. Yeah, I've heard about that. Yeah. But but that was all um, out of the '30s, and it was completely discredited. So now, what are we doing? We're coming up with a different, you know, allowing children to voluntarily sterilize themselves. Mm -hmm. um, well, yeah, that's the. Beyond the psychological, the physical path this leads to. That's have you had any students in your school actually undergo surgery or on um, puberty blockers? Not that I, well, I probably puberty block blockers, but I can't comment on the actual surgery or not. Sure. The uh, administrator here was saying, I know a lot of teachers, and I don't know any who would do something to personally harm a student in the way of using the wrong pronoun. But that's not to say there aren't those people out there. So it's okay to not harm a student that is identifying as a deviant, and yet it's perfectly fine to harm students such as Danny. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Who uh, don't want to conform to the new who, ideology. Who, who, who's actually identifying as a normal young man. Yeah. And the way they put that there, you know, that, that those people are out there. Like they're, you know, a group of evil, evil people yeah. who will call a boy a he and a girl a she. Yeah. Yeah. Well, again, I'm one of those. And, mm -hmm. You know, don't fool for don't fool for me because of that. That's fine with me. I'm not. I'm not gonna. Yeah. I'm not gonna bow to, cow tow to that. I, 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 I'm seeing it as a form of pedophilia. I really am seeing, especially especially when we're we're seeing young children being mm -hmm. encouraged and, and, and the legislation that we have in place right now. If a, a, a child comes home and identifies as, a, as, as one of the opposite sex, there's absolutely nothing a parent can do. Well, a parent faces five years in jail and criminal charges really? if, they, if they try and counsel that child away from that decision. Right? And this is, this is five, and, you know, children out in kindergarten, grade one, grade two, that kind of behavior is 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 sick. Yeah. That, that kind of legislation is sick. Yeah, that is and just bad for the human mind. It, it, it's bad for the bad for our our, our country. It's bad for uh, um, it, it's just it, it, it undermines families. Oh, I understand. It, it, and, and any any legislation that undermines families is Marxist. Yeah. It's, 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 it's blatant Marxism. Oh, yeah. So. Here's a, I actually had an article, a little clip from Global News, just giving the other side about why you're totally wrong, Wayne. Okay. You can completely turn your life around and near ruin your life. For Charlotte Finley, coming out to her parents was a positive experience, but for some of her friends, it meant facing abuse or ending up on the street. It's those parental reactions that have members of the LGBTQ2 community worried about recent policies in New Brunswick and Saskatchewan, and potentially Ontario and Manitoba soon, too. Both provinces now require schools to get parents' permission for pronoun use and name changes. This isn't about specifically pronouns. Uh, this is about uh, bringing families closer to what is happening um, in, in their child's school and ultimately in their child's classroom. Depending on the family, it could mean youth not having proper support or hiding who they are. It can cause a lot of stress and possible suicides to occur within more especially trans youth who this would be affecting a lot more as for like the name changing studies have shown lgbtq2 youth with high levels of parental rejection are about eight times more likely to report attempting suicide this sort of like family support for 2s lgbtq youth is often a life or death situation i've worked with so many young people who have to told me you know stories about how their lives have been threatened um, by their parents after coming out 
and conflict with family around a child's identity is a major factor to youth homelessness with about 40% of homeless youth identifying as LGBTQ2. It's actually the most frequently cited pathway into homelessness among 2S LGBTQ uh, young people. Alex Abramovich with the Center for Mental Health and Addiction says the policies could create one less safe space for youth. Everybody should be able to go to school freely and just be who they are and not have to have this added stress, this added sort of um, burden of, of not being able to just to, to be yourself. Some arguments behind the policy changes are about broadening parental rights surrounding gender identity. Yet Jamie Sagrove at the Canadian Centre for Gender and Sexual Diversity says being against the changes is not about opposing parents being involved in their children's lives. If a youth is not necessarily ready to tell a parent about that name change, um, wondering why maybe that is and, and making sure that there are safe environments where, where youth can explore their identity without having to think about the repercussions at home. Anna Kinderwater with Calgary Pride says she came out later in life, but while she won't be impacted by the policy changes, she says those backing the policies should consider why they are doing so. I just really encourage people to think about this from a human perspective, not just from the perspective of um, wanting to put this through because it puts a blockage um, from confronting them with a conversation that scares them and they don't understand it, which I think is a lot of the issues that I'm running into. She says parents may be scared to have the conversation with their child or they don't understand it and don't know how to approach it. Is it really worth putting something through that would harm hundreds of kids versus having a, different a difficult conversation and learning about something that makes you uncomfortable? With Manitoba and Ontario signaling changes of their own, it's a conversation more Canadians may face in the coming months. Sean Pebble, Global News. My first question there, how many of these people are you, are, are, are identifying like this because of the opportunities offered them. I really question, like, like that Anna Kinderwater, I mean, I wonder if she identified any other way, if she would still be the manager of, of that, that institution that she's the manager of. I really question that these people are, I question a lot of their motivation. And I really don't trust their motivation. Um, the whole, and again, I'm going to be very controversial here, uh, potentially, the whole concept of deviant sexual behavior revolves around predatory behavior. And we've allowed the predators into our institutions. And that's really dangerous, very, very dangerous. And Danny, you're you're feeling the effects of that. Oh, I'm not trying to behavior. Yeah. Have you seen the um, the transgender Jeopardy teacher? He was a teacher in a school where he uh, he played this Jeopardy game with the classroom, asking them about uh, the history of the transgender movement, and he was able to cite that. Everyone involved with the transgender movement, like the big names who promoted the ideology, every single one of them believes that adults should be able to have sex with consenting children. Actually, actually, it seems you're acting like this is a spurious connection. So we're going to play Jeopardy. This is, we're going to play queer theory, we're going to play queer theory pedophilia Jeopardy. Okay, answer. Uh, commonly called the godfather of queer theory. Uh, who is Foucault? Who is Foucault? I got it. Okay, 100 points. Um, Foucault, uh, another way to ask this is who argued, no, I guess the answer would be, argued for the eradication of age of consent laws as in down to infants? Mm -hmm. Who is Foucault? <laughs> Thank you. Okay, next one. Um, uh, the author of the the author of the uh, founding document of queer theory. Who is Gail Rubin? Who is Gail Rubin? Um, what percentage? No, no. The answer is fifty percent. Question is the amount in that article that was a defense of pedophilia, specifically quote boy lovers, so men who fuck boys. Oh. And since you're not believing me, 
Quote, quote, this is in the founding document of queer theory. Like communists and homosexuals in the 1950s, boy lovers are so stigmatized that it is difficult to find defenders of their civil liberties, let alone for their erotic orientation. That's in the founding document of queer theory. Um, oh, I'm sorry, I'm using facts. <laughs> A thousand, a thousand apologies. One must never let facts in the way. Oh, and she also compared, by the way, she compared pedophilia. She compared pedophilia to uh, a preference for spicy food. Um, the thing is, I have never heard of anyone who has to have years of therapy because they ate hot and sour soup. Okay, so up to 200. Now it is, uh, now it is, now it is pedophilia and queer theory for 300. Uh, that would be. Author of uh, Macho Sluts. Well, author of Macho Sluts and Public Sex. Pat Califia. Wait, wait, wait. What was it somebody said? Stay relevant. Okay, here's something from one of uh, Pat Califia's books. You know, it's really interesting. It's really interesting that when I actually start talking, about the relationship between queer theory and anarchism and pedophilia, that uh, it becomes, they, they really want to shut me up now. Um, okay, so here's Pat Califia. Pat Califia. Oh, wait, 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 just a second. Just a second. I was accused of homophobia because I am against pedophilia. Who is it who actually makes the connections between that? Okay, here's something by Pat Califia. Pat Califia has written, any child old enough to decide whether or not she or he wants to eat spinach, play with trucks, or wear shoes is old enough to decide whether or not she wants to run around naked in the sun, masturbate, sit in someone's lap, or engage in sexual activity, by which she does not mean play doctor, she means with adults. And she's very clear about that because she also says that uh, pedophiles should be more and not less uh, invested in children's lives. Uh, okay, so we're at 300. 400 is... Uh, the most famous uh, queer theorist of today. Answer. Judith. No, it is not Judith Butler. Oh. Who is Ju Judith oh. Butler? <laughs> okay, Judith Butler is the most uh, famous queer theorist of the day. We see you, all of you supporters yeah. here, who Good. do not care about trans people lives. Okay, okay, okay. Here's a great quote from Judith Butler. Here's a great quote from Judith Butler. Okay, so, so Judith Butler wrote, so I keep adding this qualification. When incest is a, so I keep adding this qualification. When incest is a violation, suggesting I think there may be occasions in which it's not. Why would I talk that way? Well, I do think that there are probably forms of incest that are not necessarily traumatic, and which or which gain their traumatic character by virtue of the conscience of social stain that they produce. Yeah, that's true. But that's one of that's one of the queer heroes. Okay, now now we have we have. Uh, uh, for 500, uh, we have um, the last one in the queer theory and pedophilia. Uh, the answer is queer theorist who has spoken out strongly against pedophilia. Zero. Zero. Who is no one? Who is no one? Not a single one. Because the entire thing is based on transgressing. That's just wrong. Pedophilia. Yeah. yeah. They, yeah. they believe in consensual pedophilia, which I think is an oxymoron because I don't think a child could consent to something like that. No. That's right. I mean, there's obviously degrees of consent, but, but, and the class, like people in the class would say, you're, you're transphobic. I'm, I'm not transphobic. I'm just stating the facts here that the founders of this ideology, all in their own textbooks or other, maybe not textbooks, but their own books, clearly state that the, an argument for pedophilia. Way back, what was it, early 2000s, when uh, same sex marriage was, was brought in? Yes. I said at that point that historians will look back on our society and recognize that as the turning point or the tipping point to the, 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 would, the le would lead to the destruction of our society. And 
it's definitely looking like I wasn't too far off on my mark. That's part one of our interview with Daniel Hudson. I trust you were, were as baffled and shocked as I was to find out what the government is doing to our children's minds, and hence our country's future. In next week's episode, things get even stranger as we discuss the shocking reason Daniel will not use restrooms in his school anymore. How Daniel's teachers waste time indoctrinating students with LGBTQ1A2S plus ideology instead of focusing on, on more appropriate lessons such as algebra formulas. Why Daniel has chosen to seek only passing grades while he focuses time and energy working as an apprentice mechanic. Why even conservative politicians are not speaking out against such psychological and physical abuse being perpetrated upon children and teens. Other options for both parents and students than woke education system. It's a daunting and somewhat squeamish subject. Nonetheless, we managed to have many laughs as, as Daniel relates how difficult it is for staff and students to keep so many pronouns and fictional identities. So be sure to tune in next week for episode number four of the Purple Microphone. This is Wayne Baker. Thank you for joining us as we realign Canada towards a path that leads to freedom and fairness for all people, regardless of their color, sexual orientation, or personal beliefs. Please share this episode of the Purple Microphone with friends and family. Remember, silence is consent. If you want to see positive change, you need to take positive action. If you have any questions or would like to help us, visit perthwellingtonpbc.ca backslash contact for our email address and phone number. One of our representatives would be happy to meet with you to discuss your concerns. To become a subscriber to The Purple Microphone and Wayne Baker's uncensored email newsletter, go to perthwellingtonpbc.ca backslash subscribe. Please consider making a contribution to help cover the costs of producing and promoting this podcast. Help save Perth Wellington and the rest of our nation from government overreach, woke ideology, and irrational policies that are incompatible with freedom, fairness, respect, and personal responsibility. To donate, go to perthwellingtonppc.ca backslash donate. You can find all these links in the description below this video along with links to any videos, articles, and books referenced in this episode. Freedom is when there's neither tyranny nor anarchy When the government works to keep people free The PPC won't lock us down in a big nanny state They'll leave us in peace to make this country great This production was approved by the Perth Wellington People's Party of Canada Electoral District Association.